so the, the webinar, the first part of the webinar today is going to give an overview of the content registration process. It's targeted towards members who are new to Crossref or existing members who want to learn more about getting your, your metadata into our systems. When content is registered with Crossref, members send us a range of information about the content, but not the full text itself. And we also enable persistent linking through identifiers. So I'm going to talk about what content you can register, what metadata you should send us, our persistent identifiers, and the process of building um, deposit files and sending them to us. We will be sending out the recording and slides um, soon after the webinar is done. My name is Rachel and I'm based in our Oxford office and I'm going to be giving the, web, giving the webinar. If you have questions as we go along, um, you can ask those in the questions panel um, and I'm, I'll, answer, I'll try to answer those at the end. If there are any that I can't answer or we run out of time, we'll get back to you via email. So, what content can you register with, with Crossref? Um, we split content into several defined content types. So, we currently support deposits for um, journals and journal articles, which is what we get the most of, books and book chapters, conference proceedings and papers, reports and working papers, dissertations, standards, posted content that includes preprints, data sets and components which are supplemental materials. You can send us other types of content that don't fit into these specific categories. Um, we'll collect some basic metadata normally as a data set and we're hoping to provide more robust support for more content types in future, for example peer review reports. When you register your content, you need to send us basic citation meta, metadata for every item that you register. So enough information to make sure to show us information that will distinguish or make your, um, your content distinct or unique from anyone else's. So this includes information like titles, authors, publication dates, issue numbers, ISSNs and ISBNs, and anything else that describes the content that you're registering. We have minimal requirements because we need to support a range of publication practices, but we ask that you could send us as much metadata as possible and that it's accurate and clean. Really, the better your metadata is, the more likely that your DOIs will be discovered and shared along with your content. When you register content with us, you're, co you're creating a complete metadata record for, for your book chapter or your journal article and your data set. So we go beyond the basics. We also collect non-bibliographic metadata about the items being registered. That's things like reference lists, information on who funded the paper, ORCID IDs, license data, clinical trial information, and information about things like errata, corrections, retractions through Crossmark, abstracts, information about relationships between items, and we're always adding more. So when you register your content with Crossref, you're also registering a persistent identifier. So Crossref uses DOIs or digital object identifiers um, as, the, as our identifier. When you submit your content to Crossref, we register the DOIs that you've included in that information. And then everyone can build persistent links to the item and ensure that the links stay visible. We've got some basic requirements for the, for the syntax of your identifier. So a DOI consists of a prefix, so you can see the 10.1 one five five on the slide that's the prefix and the suffix is what comes after that when you become a crossref member 
we give you the prefix and then you will come up with a suffix pattern for your publications. When your DOI is registered with Crossref, it becomes a link whenever the DOI registry URL, so that HTTP DOI.org, is added to the front of the DOI. Over time, if the content moves, you can update the URL registered for the identifier and the identifier based URL will continue to resolve. So our identifiers can and do change hands. So if if the content, if your publications move to a different place on the web or publications move to your platform, then you can update the existing DOIs that you have to make sure that they always direct people to your content. We get lots of questions about creating the suffix, so the part that's highlighted in bold on this slide. We have some guidelines for, um, for suffixes, but this is the really important part. You want to keep your suffixes consistent, you need them to be simple, and you need them to be short. Um, for your sake, it's good for them to be consistent. Um, so that you can easily look at a DOI, one of your DOIs and ascertain which publication that comes from. And you should establish a pattern that's easy to maintain. They should be simple for the same reason and you want to be short so that they don't take up lots of space whenever someone is using them in, in their reference list. Um, and there's a link to the full information um, and advice on suffixes in the link on this slide, which we will send around. I'm going to go into more detail about registering your content with Crossref, but the basics are simple. You create Crossref XML either through systems on your end or some tools that we have. You send the XML to us or upload it at Crossref and we process it and then you or your systems make sure that everything has been registered. So talking about creating XML, everything that comes to our system is ultimately an XML. We've got a few ways around that if you're not technical and you don't know how to work with XML. But first I'll go over the basics of what we do need from, from XML. Crossref has its own metadata schema, or basically its own format for deposits. A schema is a set of rules defining what, can, what information can be included and how it should be included. And the schema itself is fairly rigid so that we can get consistent data, but it is comprehensive, so it does aim to, um, it does aim to be, have enough included to, to reflect different publishing models. Um, obviously publishing models change, so we do update this schema regularly to accommodate how things evolve and we rarely do anything that isn't backwards, that isn't backwards compatible, so things that um, can be added to older deposits without causing problems. Um, our most recent schema version is 4.4.0 4 but we do accept deposits with um, 4.3.0 through to 4.4.0. We've got a metadata schema that can be used to deposit everything and then we also have what's called a resource schema which is basically something that can be used to update or select pieces of metadata, add select pieces of metadata for your registered content. So for example if you wanted to add funding information or license information to your existing Crossref deposits. We don't ask you to redeposit the full XML that you gave us in the first instance. We can basically take um, a list of that information as a CSV file and add it to your existing metadata. So it's quicker and easier for our members to be able to add to their existing deposits. Um, the initial XML that you create for content registration, and this is this is a file, um, this is a file showing um, that XML um, com in compliance with our schema. So, 
it might look quite technical or quite complicated, but actually if you look at it in more detail, um, it's, it's, you'll be able to see the kind of information it's asking for. So the initial XML that you create for to register content with Crossref, it must contain metadata and identifiers. The schema enforces a rigid structure and the, the different elements or information that it provides need to appear in a defined order. So this is an example. And you can see highlighted every Every XML that you send us has some member specific information in the head section. So for example, there's an email address and it should be an email for you. It should be an email address that goes to someone in your organization because this address is where information on if your deposits have been successful or not, that's where it gets sent. So the depositor name should be the name of your organization and the email address should be the email of someone in your organization who is in charge of making sure that the, um, that the deposits run correctly and that your DOIs are being registered. Um, this is a basic journal article deposit. So again, if you look at this, you can see things like um, in the journal section, you can see the title of the journal, a short title, and the ISSN for it. And then it goes on to information on issue and volume and dates. And you can also give an identifier to a journal or a specific journal issue if you would like. So as I said, the journal metadata is at the top and then that's followed by the issue information. And again, this is useful if someone is trying to distinguish between two articles that are quite similar. Things like the publication date or the issue that the piece of content was published in might, um, might help make um, distinguish that. The article itself, so going on down the file, the article has information like the title of the, of the, of the paper, the author name, the publication date, the, the page numbers of that article, and of course the information on the identifier. So the DOI data section contains the DOI that you want to register for that piece of content. And the resource talks about, the resource is the URL where the piece of content is currently located. And those are really the key parts of information to register your DOI. Um, everything is sent as XML, so this is a sample citation deposit. So your citations can be marked up, which is the most accurate and the most challenging option. Or you can send citations for your papers that are un unstructured, so not marked up. You can just put them in, in one block of text like this. If you aren't able to generate XML, and lots of our members aren't. We do have some other options. So we've got a web deposit form, which is a manual entry form. Um, and it's used by a lot of our members and we're also working to make it better. This is really basic in that you, you enter your data field by field. So you just type it in. And what it does is it takes the information that you typed in, it converts it to XML, and then submits that XML for processing. So it will then, whenever you enter that information, you hit, you give it your Crossref user ID and password, and you click submit. And the system will send you XML, and it will also let you know that those DOIs have been registered in our system. So you don't need to know XML to use that form. And as I said, it is, it is very popular and we are working to, um, to, um, to provide an updated and better version of it later this year. And some of our members have systems that produce JATS or NLM XML. And we have written a transformation tool for that. So using that web deposit form that I just mentioned, you can upload JATS or NLM formatted files article by article, and we will convert those to Crossref XML and deposit them in our system. 
Um, and we also, if you want to add to your existing metadata records by adding, say, license or funding information, we can take that information in a CSV file and upload it so that the, that information can be added to your existing deposits. That also can, if you're interested in participating in our similarity check service, you can also deposit um, full text links to your content using that form. So there are ways to deposit and update metadata with Crossref that don't involve XML. So don't be stuck if you're not sure get in touch with our support team and they'll be able to help. You must, whenever you start to, um, whenever you want to register content with us, you must deposit metadata and identifiers. And you can include all other metadata in your initial registration as well. But some types of metadata can be added as you're able to after you've registered the content. So that's things like including references, if you want to participate in our cited by service, funding data, components, which are supplementary, supplemental material records, crossmark information, text mining, and relationships. So again, you can provide little pieces of metadata that get added to your existing deposits without having to redeposit the full XML for an article or an issue. So if you've created your, your XML file and you're not using the web deposit form, the next thing you need to do is be able to get your XML to Crossref. Most deposits are made by what's called HTTPS post. So if you have any other, if any sort of automated system, you'll, you'll be using that. But we do have an interface for uploading files one by one. Um, which is called the Crossref Admin Interface. You go to it, log in, and in the submission, in the upload section, you can upload your XML file, and we will process that for you and send an email once that's done. And then the web deposit form mentioned earlier will submit files for you. When your file has been uploaded, it gets added to a queue. Most files are processed within a few minutes, but if lots of publishers are sending us a lot of um, a lot of files, it can it can slow down if we have a lot of traffic, like everything. So if you've submitted something and you don't get an email with the the submission log, you can always go and check um, in the deposit system. You can see you can view the submission queue and you can check that your deposit is still in the queue. So sometimes we just need people to be a little bit patient. Um, and if you need the file to be processed quickly, do get in touch and we can sometimes move them, move them up the queue. So if your deposit, once your file is processed, we will send you a record. And if it's processed successfully, then that's great. You're done. Your metadata record is in our massive database and you can start using the DOI that you've registered to, so for people to link persistently to your publications. If your deposit fails, then you'll need to go and look at your submission logs and cor correct whatever issues exist. The submission logs themselves, we generate a log file for every file sent to our system. We send the logs out by email, but you can also poll for logs if you've got a system that can support that. These logs or this information is in XML so that they're machine readable, but you can also read it as a person. Depend, um, you can also read it as a person um, if you're just reviewing the files yourself, which again, lots of people do. So this is an example of a submission log, um, and this will be sent to you via email after you register your content. The really important part is at the bottom. So maybe you're adding lots of DOIs, you get a big long file back. I always scroll down to the bottom and look at this batch data section. This is a summary of your log results. So if the record count and success count match, so say your record count says three and your success count is three, then that's great. You're finished, everything was processed successfully. 
if there are any failures, so in this example you can see the failure count is one, then you'll need to address those because they mean the record wasn't added into our system. If you have a warning count and you can see there's one in this example, it means that the record was added and the identifiers are registered but something needs attention. So I'll talk, I'll talk more about why that might be. Submissions do fail and there are some strange problems that we need to, that we can, we can try to figure out, but most of the failures or the problems fall into three categories. So maybe your XML isn't valid. Um, we only accept XML that parses or um, that adheres to our schema. So if your XML is, is invalid or incorrect for some reason, then we can't process that submission. Um, we do have a tool that can help you to try to validate or um, parse your schema before you actually submit it to us. So that can be good to use once as you're getting started with deposits. Some things, um, but yeah, some things that we, we do try to check and validate. So we make sure that, for example, the ISSN and the ISBN are valid so that we don't get um, information that then can't be used later on. Um, your file might fail because of an issue with your title. So we ask that titles be deposited with us consistently because um, so every, every article that you deposit for a certain title, the title must be spelt um, the same way and we match that with the ISSN. That's just to make sure again that we don't get messy information um, and so that if people want to search on the title on the title of your um, publication, then they can easily find the title and all of the content that's been published. And there might be permissions issues. Um, journal titles do change hands quite often. So if you've added or sold a title, do make sure that Crossref knows about it so that we can make the appropriate ownership changes on our end. And then we've got one type of warning. So if the metadata in your record matches something already in our system, we'll put a conflict warning in your log. Sometimes these aren't problems. You know, sometimes, public, sometimes articles do share quite similar information. For example, you might have an article and then you might have um, a review of an article. Um, so sometimes those aren't problems, but the majority of conflicts that we identify are for duplicate items or with items with very, very sparse um, or very little metadata. And both, both are something that we want to avoid. Um, when your content is registered um, and your DOI has started to work, your DOIs have started to work, things happen to it. It doesn't just stay in a Crossref database and never gets used. We'll have whatever metadata you've sent to us and we sent it out to a variety of sources. For example, libraries, indexing services, researchers, educational tools, discovery services, and more. So we make information on your publications available through most many channels instantly. Although it can take um, maybe a day to go into other channels like our API, but basically giving your information on your publications to Crossref gives a way for lots and lots of people to find and use your publications. Your links are persistent. So when you register your content with Crossref, we register your DOI and URL with the central DOI resolver. And once that's done, your identifiers will be ready for linking immediately. And we also require members to link from their reference lists using DOIs. So when your content is registered, our members will be able to discover those identifiers and use them to link directly to you. Here's what I mean. So whenever you look at a reference list from a publisher, you can see that there are DOIs for, for the content that has DOIs that's available in reference lists. And it means that people will be able to persistently link to your articles. Whenever you join Crossref, if you start to assign DOIs to your content, we will um, 
we will tell other publishers about that so that they know that they should start linking to you using the DOI. So it helps researchers who are follow the thread of their research from one paper to another across lots of different publishers. So in our help section we've got lots of de documentation and we also have a small but very good support team. Um, we mostly give support via email but if you need help in another way please let us know. In the past we've only had support um, based in based in the United States but as of next week we're adding a support person in the UK who will be able to add who will be able to um, provide um, provide more help by giving us more capacity and also being available at different times of day so please do ask if you have questions and we will do our best to help there are lots of resources to help. I won't go through these, but these were all of the links that are referenced in, um, in the presentation about depositing metadata. So I will send around these slides um, very shortly so that you have information on them um, and you can use them whenever you need. Um, but just to go on, now that we've talked about depositing your metadata, um, the focus of the rest of the webinar is about maintaining your metadata. Um, this is really important in that you don't just deposit metadata with Crossref and then go away. It's an ongoing process of maintaining, adding to and updating that information so that people find it as easy as possible to find and link to and use the content that you publish. So. I was talking just before about what, what constitutes a complete metadata record. Um, we know that it's not easy to gather and send along all of this information and we do only really require bibliographic metadata, so enough information to distinguish the, your publications and the unique articles from any other articles on the web. But a complete record containing things like ORCID IDs, page numbers, reference lists, funding information, will all combine to help place your content on the scholarly map and in fact give people more ways to find and use it. So if you've gone through, so say you, um, you started depositing content and you didn't deposit all of the metadata or some of it's incorrect or um, yeah, you had to you had to be a bit creative with it. That's okay. So I'm going to talk about how you can update your existing records with corrections and enhancements. When you create a record um, and deposit content with us, the most persistent part and the part that you can't change is the identifier you register or the DOI. The rest of the record can be updated and expanded continuously. Again, we make a distinction between bibliographic and other metadata. It's all important, but when you create a metadata record, you must include bibliographic metadata and identifiers whenever your content is initially registered. You can include all the metadata we collect in your initial registration, but most non-bibliographic metadata can be added post-registration as you are able. Um, I'll get to that in a second. Is said the bibliographic information records citation metadata um, and it can also include things like ORCIDs and JATS formatted abstracts. They're both optional, the ORCIDs and the abstracts, but we do recommend them. That's because this metadata is used to identify the item that's being registered with us, but more important than that, it, it gets distributed to third parties and is used to look up your DOI so that people can link to your content. Um, so it's very important. And as I mentioned, you can add some types of metadata to your record after it has been registered. So it means that you can create a record for a journal article that contains references so you can participate in our cited by service um, or things like cross mark or funding information that you can 
provide in segments without resubmitting the record as a whole. You can add all of this information whenever you need it and you won't incur any additional fees. There are no costs to add to or update your metadata. So if you've discovered errors in your metadata or if you need to update it for any other reason, you'll need to redeposit your, um, your metadata with the changes included. Any metadata already in our system will be overwritten. So make sure you send us everything, particularly whenever you're updating bibliographic metadata. So for example, if you deposit your DOIs with an online publication date before the item has been published in print, you can update the metadata once the print information is available. The data can be resubmitted using, um, so say you need to um, update the URL only, they're a bit special. You can update the URLs where your, your, your DOIs point to by resubmitting the, just that portion of your metadata record. Or you can send us a list of DOIs and URLs and we will update those for you. And we can provide you with a list of your DOIs and the current URLs that they point to in case that's, in case that's useful in, in doing that work. If you need to remove metadata from a record, that's sometimes a little bit more difficult because you can't really remove top level bibliographic metadata without breaking things. That's only necessary when something has gone really wrong. So for example, you've registered something by mistake, in which case you need to override it with non-descriptive metadata. But please contact us before you try to do that um, because we'll be able to, to talk you through the best practice of doing that. Um, we also, because we ask you to update your resource metadata in segments, we require that you be really express, explicit whenever you remove resource metadata from your record. We ask that you submit an empty top level tag. So you can see here, I've got cross mark with a slash afterwards. So that will, what that will do is we'll, it will remove a segment of resource metadata. So for example, if you wanted to remove all cross mark metadata associated with the DOI, then you would need to submit the XML with that closed cross mark tag, as you see on the side, or the example fr.program name, the fundref one, that would remove all funding metadata. If you decide to do a really big update of your metadata, then there are some things to keep in mind. So sending us a large amount of files is, is usually okay, depending on your definition of large. If you're sending in thousands of updates, so for example, you're moving everything to a different platform, then you might want to email our support team and just let us know that that's coming so that we can, um, so that we can make alliances for it or potentially special arrangements depending on the size you want to update. Um, I've talked about how to make sure like your metadata is correct and that what, you know, and how complete it is, but you need to, um, in order to do that, you need to, you need to evaluate the metadata that you already have with Crossref, which can be tricky. And we do have plans to make it much easier for you to see at a glance where you're, where the problems are, and that should be available later this year. There's still a lot that can be done now, however, and I'm going to walk you through some of the basics. We'll start with how to view the metadata that you've registered with us. So if you want to easily look at the, your basic metadata that you've registered with Crossref, um, we've got a metadata search interface at search.crossref.org. It presents a segment of metadata, not everything, but it does let you know some basics. So you can search by DOI or ISSN article title or author. This is, it's a free text search, so you can just type it in and it's free to use. So in the example you can see on the screen, you can see after OCLC, um, there's an encoding issue in the article title 
and it jumps out at you a bit, the diamond question mark. Other common things to look for are author information. We get lots of authors who use this tool to try to find, like, to try to find citations and they, they contact us a lot to complain about their names in the publisher metadata. Maybe it's been spelt wrong, it has the wrong word order, or they're missing entirely, which as you know causes problems whenever they try to claim credit for their work. We also have a fairly robust REST API that's publicly available and this is a programmatic way that can be used to retrieve or interrogate the information that you've deposited with Crossref. It displays most of the metadata that you've registered. Um, references aren't included in this unless you've opted to make them public. But by default, um, references aren't distributed to the public, but you can opt to do so. And if you want to, you can contact Crossref support and we'll tell you how to make that happen. So if you're familiar with working with APIs, then you can use the REST API to retrieve all metadata for your prefixes or retrieve it by DOI as, um, as displayed here under view a single metadata record. This is the example of the kind of record that you can get from our REST API. The results are in a format called JSON and they'll include the majority of the information that you've registered with Crossref. And you can do this, you can use the REST API to do some pretty basic troubleshooting. So on the slide, there's an example that will show you um, query that you can put in. You just need to add your prefix where it says XXXX and this will show you the number of DOIs that we can see that you've registered. If that number doesn't match what you expect then you might need to do some further digging and we can help with that. Once you register content it's registered fairly quickly in the REST API. So it normally, um, once you, if you register a DOI today, you'll normally need to wait until tomorrow to see it in the REST API. Um, for most queries using the REST API, including a row count of zero in the query, will give you a count of the records in the request, but not the records themselves. So if you're not able to ingest lots of JSON formatted data, you can still do some basic troubleshooting using this. You can also do some fairly specific queries. So for example, if you're registering funding information with Crossref, you can look up all DOIs with funder, all of your DOIs with funder identifiers. Or you can look up the number of records with a funder identifier and a funder name or you can look up the number of records with award numbers. And this kind of inf this, these kind of searches will give you an idea of how effective the, the funding information that you've sent to Crossref is overall. It's also handy if you're working with a vendor and they're submitting, the, the cross, they're submitting data to Crossref for you and you just want to keep, keep on top of what they're, what they're submitting on your behalf. Um, and just some more quick examples. So you can see how many records, for example, of your records have crossmark information, how many have license information, and how many of your records have at least one ORCID ID included in the, in the metadata. We also have an XML API that can be useful. You can, look up, you can use it to look up the metadata you've deposited for an item really quickly. Again, you just paste the link into your, your web browser and that will bring up this information. The results will include references if you supply your system login whenever you're doing the query. Um, as I said, we don't display references to the public unless you've enabled that, but we do let publishers see the references that they've deposited themselves. And we also have a tool called the Deposit Harvester. Um, it's OAI PMH based, but it will retrieve your data in title based sets. I've got links to all of the tools that I'm mentioning at the end of these slides. So if you want to learn more about any of them, this information will be available whenever the slides are sent out. And again, our support team will be, be able to answer questions if you want to get, go more in depth in, in terms of implementing them. 
This is an example of the type of record that you get whenever you use the Deposit Harvester or the XML API. Um, a lot of you, I'm sure, will recognize it because it looks just like the XML that you send in for deposits. The Deposit Harvester is a good way of retrieving complete metadata. Say you've acquired content that's been registered by another publisher, then you'll be able to, to get their metadata in a format that's, that's ready for you to, to update it. If you, do if you do acquire content or publications from another Crossref member, if that content includes Crossref DOIs, then you will be put in charge of that metadata as well. You can re-register it if you need to, but if the metadata is good, then really you just need to update the URLs that the DOIs point to so that they, so that they um, point to your platform. Um, and we can help with that. But it's always just a good idea that the, to confirm that the metadata that you're responsible for is good. And we have some reports to help you with metadata issues. Some are sent by email, usually to the technical contacts that we have for your organization. So if you've had staff change, if you've had people leave or join, please make sure that you keep Crossref up to date. You can just email member at crossref.org and we'll update the information. We want to make sure that if we're sending emails to you that they go to the correct person and they don't bounce back because someone has left your organization. Um, and please do make sure to look at the emails that we send you. They normally come from reports at crossref.org. We also send a fair number of emails to members about metadata quality issues. About a third of the requests that come through to our support team are related to metadata quality issues. Um, people or organizations or um, systems that consume metadata report problems one by one. At Crossref, we don't touch your metadata because you're the publisher and you're the authoritative source of the information. So we need to pass those reports along to you for action. We get a lot of complaints from authors about how their names or author titles are represented and our metadata affiliates also pass along complaints about missing page numbers, incorrect titles, just little things but they do make a big difference because so many systems use to um, query our metadata and display it so even little errors can have quite a wide ranging impact. I'm going to go into detail about a few of our reports. We've got a title list on our website that allows you to look up your titles by ISSN or title. It displays coverage information, which can be illuminating. So if you do nothing else, journal publishers might want to scan the coverage listed to make sure you haven't missed out depositing uh, metadata for any issues or registered content with a publication year or of something like 2032, 1332, we've seen things like this. So if you have the title data available as a CSV file, it's a big file, but if you have a lot of titles, that's a good way to do it. And finally, we have um, Schematron reports. These, these are used to identify messy, messy metadata. So we need to be flexible and accommodate variances in information. So our deposit schema can't keep all of the questionable data without blocking good information as well. So we do a post-deposit review of metadata and pick up items that we think might be incorrect. Um, so for example, um, putting together the suff someone's suffix and their, their surname together, or having incorrect punctuation in the surname, pulling in the email into that. Um, these reports get emailed out weekly on Saturday and we send out an average of 45 reports a week. That's really tiny considering that we have thousands of members but it is an effective tool and it does really help members clean up the information that they have with us. It's, as I said before, if you need help, our support team are really great at um, at helping out with potential issues. So we do, um, please do just email um, and we'll get back to you. And then finally, as I said, we've, we've included um, a list of resources that were used in those slides. And I've also linked to a video of a talk given by Ian Calvert at our annual meeting last year.
The talk is only about 30 minutes long and it focuses on metadata quality. He has some fun with cross-ref metadata and data visualizations, so if you do have some time and you're interested, then please watch it. And finally, I think we have maybe about um, 10 minutes to, um, to take questions. So if you do have any, um, I'll take them now.